Well, it's great to see you here this morning as we continue on in our sermon series. Who are you? And uh, tonight, uh, today, uh, looking at live with integrity as we focus on the issue of integrity in our lives as Christians. But before we do that, let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you are here with us this morning, that your spirit is here among us this day. We ask that you to help us as we take seriously these teachings of Jesus and the way that you call us to live a life of integrity. Help us to sense your presence, your guidance, and your spirit that we take these teachings out into the world and live them this week. We ask also that you would bless us, help us to sense your son present here this day. For we ask these things in his holy name. Amen. So there's a big event that happens this week. Anybody know what that big event is that's going to happen this week? What is it? What? Valentine's Day. No, no, I wasn't talking about Valentine's Day. I was talking about pitchers and catchers reporting for Major League Baseball spring training. That's the big event for this one. Now, I know you're probably thinking, oh, Michael, you're such a romantic, right? Now, I just want you to know, no, I've already got my wife two presents, so I'm cool. That's okay. I got it covered. But I was watching ESPN this week. Yeah, she's already, she got, she got her flowers already, all right? Uh, but uh, I was watching ESPN, and that was on the TV, and I was reminded of a, an old story that I heard about these two Major League Baseball players, how well, they, they made this agreement that whoever died and went to heaven first would come back and tell the other one whether there's baseball in heaven. And so the one dies, and he goes to heaven, and he returns, and he comes to his friend, and he says, I got good news, and I got bad news. The good news is, yes, there's baseball in heaven. The bad news is that next, 30, next Thursday, you're the starting pitcher. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, I'm not going to be interested in hearing, you know, whether or not there's baseball there. What I really want to hear is this. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'm going to put you over much. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's what I really want to hear. You know, uh, as I was thinking about that this week, uh, uh, really what Jesus is saying, if we've been faithful and little, if we have integrity in the things that he gives us in this life, there'll be, well, there'll be an eternal reward for it. And he's so it's so important that he teaches us about it many different times in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, for instance, this week I had a journey group that I did. Uh, by the way, there's a journey group guide as you exit this morning on your left in that uh, information rack if you want one, and this week is on, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, one of the things that I heard somebody once say that, the, that purity of heart is to will one thing. That is to say, with unmixed motives to seek to serve God in integrity. And we talked about that uh, and what that would mean. And, and, you know, another place where Jesus talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount is, well, what was in that video this morning where Jesus says, hey, do you think that I've come to destroy the prophets? No, I haven't come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. And I'm going to tell you what, whoever is, uh, whoever is willing to teach those things that are the commands of God, our Creator, and willing to live them, that person is going to be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven because that person has lived a life of integrity in their service to God. Many places that he teaches us about the importance of integrity in our Christian life. You know, as uh, we were in that journey group this week and we were trying to talk about well, what does purity of heart mean? What's that like? I think we kind of stumbled into what integrity is like. And one person said, well, that would be somebody who is authentic. That is to say that who they presented themselves to you as that's who they really were. You could trust them to be that way. Uh, or somebody that was caring and loving, that somebody was there for that other person, that somebody that talked the way of the Lord and lived the way of the Lord. See that kind of matching between our teachings and our living? That's integrity. And as I was thinking about that, I thought, well, okay, so how could I live with integrity as a Christian? And I think there are various areas in our lives that I wanted to lift up this morning that, that we can seek to live with integrity. First, for instance, is uh, in our homes, in our families, in those people who are closest to us, in, in how we treat them and how we deal with them. You know, as I was thinking about that, I was reminded of an old movie. Maybe you saw this movie before. Anybody ever saw the movie Gandhi? About Mahatma Gandhi, kind of a biography of him. Uh, at one point in that movie, it's where that point where he and his wife are in South Africa and they're resisting the injustice of the apartheid system in South Africa. And what they do is they set up an ashram, which is a, a, a kind of a collective community of people of a variety of different races that are living together in peace and working together uh, as an example of what that could be. 
Uh, and at one point, he's, well, he's pretty burdened by life and, and by what's going on. And he comes into the house one day and he says to his wife, okay, he says, your assignment this day is to go out and clean and rake the latrine. And she says to him, no, I can't do that. That's below my station. And he gets mad. He blows up on her. And he grabs her and he's kind of shaking her, you know, you're going to do that. And she looks at him and says, I am your wife. Don't you understand? I am your wife. You can't treat me like this. I'm your wife. And what she's saying is, don't you understand, husband, the kind of respect and honor and dignity, the kind of cherishing and love that you're supposed to show towards me? That's who you're supposed to be in this marriage. I am your wife. And he kind of comes to his senses and he backs up and he apologizes to her because he's realized that yeah, he's, he's trying to change a nation. But his relationships are home, at home are falling apart. No integrity there. No consistency there. Sometimes it's those people that are the closest to us, that we are the least respectful to, the least honoring of, and that's, that's not integrity. We're called to better than that. Sometimes it's not simply what happens in our homes, but it's how... We deal with other people outside of our homes and the people that we live with, the people that are the closest, they see that and the effect that it has. You know, I was reading this week a true story about this guy and he had this little son and the son would go with him where he was and, and he would watch dad as he dealt with people in the community and uh, he said that he would deal with people in the community kind of uh, overreactive, uh, kind of uh, lack of patience, impatient with them, unkind towards them. And, and he didn't realize this, but what happened would, his son would ask him after he'd see this stuff, he'd say, Dad, do you love me? Yes, son, I sure I love you. And it, that kept happening over and over again. He'd, he'd treat somebody unkindly. Dad, do you love me? And he said one day he was treating somebody, you know, in a kind of an reactive and ugly way. And the, the little boy said to him afterwards, he says, Dad, do you love me? And he said, oh, you realized it. He said, this kid is seeing what I'm doing and how I'm treating people in the community out there, and he's thinking, maybe I'm going to be treating him like that. Dad, do you love me? Do we have integrity in our homes, in the way that we treat people and honor people, and how that's consistent with the way that we live in the community as well? That's what he's calling us to. Not only in our homes, but also uh, in our business, the way we do business dealings, in our work. You know, years ago, I was uh, uh, going to school at OSU, and one of the ways that I paid my way through OSU was uh, there was a little Phillips 66 toll plaza. is out on the Turner Turnpike. It was the one that had the Phillips 66 and the Stuckies. Anybody remember Stuckies? Uh, and, you know, and uh, I, this is about three blocks from the house, and I'd drive over there, and I'd work there uh, eight-hour shift, uh, six days a week, and I'd go to school. <laughs> that was kind of an interesting you know, combination. Uh, but the, the guys out there, they were kind of, well, they were kind of rough, good old boys. Uh, and they didn't necessarily deal up and up in a lot of ways. And, and so little things would happen frequently, uh, like they would go out and they would take money out of the company till in order to go into Stuckey's and buy themselves Cokes and ice cream and, and candies and jazz like that because, quote, Phillips didn't pay us enough. Or, uh, you know, they would bring in their cars and they would work on their cars for hours on company time. Or they would take their time sheets and they'd add in extra hours to their time sheets uh, in order to get more money. I mean, it, that was just like the start of the stuff that they would do. Uh, and I was lucky. And then my mom and dad, they had several businesses that they ran and, and we didn't do business like that. And so I could kind of resist that. But these guys, they just didn't know any better. And, and that's how they dealt with business. You know, as, as I was thinking about that this week, I, was, I read a true story about uh, something that happened with a high school teacher. This high school teacher had uh, these kids that they were on one side of the, of the high school campus, 
and he had to take them over to this other room for their class, and so he was leading them across the high school campus, and they walked by the tennis courts, and, and somebody in the tennis courts there that day in practice had knocked a ball over the wall, and he was out there in the parking lot, and as they walked by, one of the kids walked out there and grabbed the tennis ball, and, and he was walking along, bouncing the tennis ball right, and, and so they get to the room where they're supposed to be going, and the teacher, this high school teacher, he says he stopped, and he was waiting for this kid to come up, and as he came up, he says, I need the tennis ball, and the kid says, why, it's mine. No, it's not. It's the school's. You know it's not yours. To which the kid replies, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Anybody ever heard that one? And he says, you mean if you just accidentally find something wherever it's laying, that it's yours and you can take it? Yeah. And he says, well, I'll tell you what. What if you go down, if somebody was to go down to the bank today and they had their paycheck and they had their their deposit slip, and they made out their deposit slip for a certain amount that was almost the entirety of their check, and then they took $100 in cash, and they sent the little deal in through the chute there, and it came back out, and they got $700 in cash instead, and the, all the amount that they wanted to put into their account was, it went in there as well, so they got $600 extra. Would that be that person's money? The kid said, yeah, sure. And he says, well, okay, so what if uh, that day, uh, you know, as they were checking out, uh, the woman who was doing that register, she was $600 short, and so she got fired for that. To which the kid replied, too bad, so sad. And then they said, she, he said to her, uh, this kid, said, oh, okay, so what if the guy who got the $600, he put that $600 back in that little tube and sent it back through the chute out to the tailor then and said to her, you gave me $600 too much, here's your money back. And the kid said, what kind of an idiot would do that? That's $600 in free money. To which the teacher said, I did. I did it. He said the reason why he told him that was he wanted him to see that there's a different way of living from the way that he was talking about, where you had integrity in your business dealings. We're called to integrity in our homes, integrity in our business dealings, because, well, as Jesus, as Jesus teaches us and as the psalm says, blessed is the person who walks in integrity before the Lord, he will never be shaken. We're called integrity in our relationship with Christ and how we serve Him. Uh, can I tell you about a baptism by fire that I once had? So anyway, so I was in seminary. I decided I was going into the ministry, and so I went down to seminary in Dallas. And, and there in Dallas, I, uh, I hired on as I was going to seminary, a little part-time job over at the local church there in Dallas. And and part of my portfolio was to do pastoral care, and part of my portfolio was to work with the youth. And so I was there for a few months. And after a few months, uh, one evening, there was this young lady. She's 17 years old. She's still in high school. And she's, she comes to me. She's got this worried look on her face. And she says, I need to talk to you about something. And I look at her. And so she's obviously worked up about something. I said, okay, so let's walk over here away from the group. So we walk over away from the group, and she says to me, I've been having an affair with a senior pastor. Welcome to the ministry. <laughs> so I've been having a, and I said, what? And it's kind of like one of those situations where you go, did I, what did you just say? I've been having an affair with a senior pastor. Now, here there's a long story about how that all got worked out, okay? But I just wanted to say that that guy he lacked integrity. He lacked sexual integrity. And it's interesting, uh, the way he rationalized to her, she told me, the way that he rationalized to her what she, he was doing was, he would say this to her, and I'll get this one. He would say to her, if the other people in the church can do it, I can do it too. And as my mom used to say to me, if everybody jumped off the top of the Empire State Building, would you do it too? What kind of rationalization is that? He lacked sexual integrity. He lacked integrity in his relationship with his wife. He apparently had forgotten that section in the marriage service where it says, and keep only unto her as long as you both shall live. He lacked integrity in his relationship with the church. 
because he forgot that he had made a commitment to live according to the highest standards of Christian morality and ethics in his life as a pastor. He lacked integrity in his relationship with that girl who he was supposed to be a, a caregiver for and a spiritual guide for, and instead he took advantage of her. You know, years ago I, heard, I told somebody this story and they said to me, did he not understand that that girl was crying out for help? He lacked integrity in his relationship with the Lord. He'd been given a charge by Christ, and he didn't live it. Now, you know, I've gone through that, and that wasn't exactly the best of ways to get introduced into the ministry, okay? Uh, but I did learn one thing out of that, and that is over the years to simply ask myself this question. Are you living with integrity before Jesus? Are you faithfully serving him with integrity? I think that's a question we all can ask ourselves. Now, thanks be to God, there are times when we, you know, we just don't act with integrity. And thanks be to God that his grace and mercy is there for us. And, and if we'll say, oh, I gotta stop this, and we'll turn back to him, his forgiveness is there, and his healing is there, and his spirit is there to guide us. But this is really important. Because blessed is the person who walks with integrity before the Lord, for that person will never be shaken. And friend, I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, I'm not really looking for the baseball game, <laughs> okay? I'm looking for that voice that says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in little, I'll put you over much. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Amen? Let's pray together. We praise you, Lord. We give you thanks for your grace towards us for the ways that we fail to live up to what we need to be and what you've called us to be, and we lack integrity. Still, your grace is there. Your forgiveness is there. And your Holy Spirit working in our lives to change us into the persons that you know we can be and we will be in your Son. Help us. Help us this week to, to look at our lives and to think about how it is that we can live in more integrity before you and in that process, to give praise and honor and glory to your name. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Into the